Welcome back. We've been talking about differential GPS. And what I'd like to do is uh, take that out of the realm of the academic, where we had some equations, worked on ionospheric errors, and uh, come to a very, very practical application. In other words, um, when we use it to land airplanes. And what you see here is a top view of the approach to the airport in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And uh, that airport is denoted J-A-C. It appears here in the lower left. Jackson Hole is the largest city in Wyoming, uh, so access to that uh, airport is important. And the traditional route, if you're approaching here from the northeast, is to follow a straight line defined by a navigation aid on the ground. So you fly this straight line, and you notice when you come to the point where all of a sudden you can pick up the beam coming from another ground-based navigation aid at the Jackson Hole Airport. And so you just fly this straight line following the one nav aid. When you pick up this beam, you turn left, and you head right down towards Jackson. Um, the, the, this works fine. It's been safe. Uh, however, if you take a look here at the map, already the future or the present is shown here, it would be nice to just take this softer turn like this. And it's particularly important because right in here we have the Grand Tetons uh, National Park. And so that's uh, an environmentally sensitive area. Uh, neither the people there nor the animals there really like the aircraft overfly. So there was a wish, certainly from the naturalists, to use an alternate approach, one that follows this smooth curve here. And there was also a wish from the aircraft operators for a different approach. They could save time and they could save fuel. I think the amount of time that you save is on the order of four minutes, and um, I don't remember offhand how much fuel is saved. And you, you might say, well, there's not that much fuel saved per flight, but if you multiply it by the number of flights going into Jackson Hole, it becomes uh, important and meaningful on, uh, uh, in terms of the environment. So the important thing about this application is that GPS unlike the ground-based navigation aids that are being used uh, in the older approach, is valid over the entire area, and in fact, over the entire volume surrounding Jackson Hole. And so the aviation community calls this area navigation. So you can pick out new approaches and design them around waypoints which are not based on things on the ground, but rather just based on an electronic data point in your avionics. That's exactly what's done here. If you take a look, you'll see the waypoints along the way. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, and finally, of course, Jackson Hole, and the GPS computer, the GPS receiver on the airplane is plenty strong enough to just fly to the first waypoint, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one. And that's what's done now increasingly by aircraft coming into Jackson Hole. Let me show you another example. And this one is Juneau, Alaska. And what you're seeing here is the so-called Gastineau Channel. It extends from Juneau which is the city right here, down southward towards Seattle. And so the aircraft flying up to Juneau from the continental or conterminous United States are flying northward. And if they can fly this channel, they're very happy about it because they save quite a bit of fuel. If they cannot fly this channel, they have to actually fly around this island 
and I can't show you the whole path here, this map isn't big enough, but essentially they go behind this island and come in the other direction to Juno. <clears throat> the difficulty with that older approach is it also takes time, burns quite a bit more fuel, more than Jackson Hole. In addition, when you approach Juno from this other direction, there's a ridge there. So the weather ceiling not only has to be three or 400 feet above sea level, the weather ceiling has to be three or 400 feet above this ridge, which is 500 feet high. And in Alaska, you can very often get weather below that, which means that an aircraft dispatched, let's say from Seattle, wouldn't be able to go in to Juneau if the weather ceiling was below that 900 feet or so uh, for the, the northerly approach. That aircraft would either have to return to Seattle or fly into another Alaskan airport uh, somewhere near uh, Juneau. So this is another example of aviation taking example, uh, taking advantage of the area navigation capability of GPS. Notice this path here is, uh, has some wiggles in it, and at the end it has a serious dogleg to the left. So to instrument that all with ground-based nav aids is impractical, and it was only with the advent of GPS that Alaska Air, Alaska Airlines in particular, began to fly this approach and today, they estimate it saves them about a million dollars a year and, of course, all of the associated fuel. So we're happy for that. By the way, Juneau is the capital of Alaska, and it's not accessible by road. You have to get there either by air or sea. So for them, uh, aviation is just a, a critical thing, and uh, they're grateful for this. On those last two maps, we talked about Jackson Hole and Juneau, Alaska, and we were mostly interested in the navigation of the aircraft laterally. In Gastineau Channel in particular, we're very, very eager to keep the airplane in the center of that channel, far away from those 5,000-foot mountains on either side of the channel. But GPS has that volumetric capability, and it also allows you to solve for the vertical. And that's what we talk, talk about here. And um, this is an aircraft approach shown from the side. And the traditional approach to an airport is very often a so-called step-down approach. You come to a location defined by a terrestrial radio navigation aid, perhaps the intersection of two such beams, like we saw with Jackson Hole. And at that point, you're allowed to descend to a new alt uh, lower altitude. You are then supposed to keep that altitude <clears throat> until you come to another point defined by the terrestrial radio nav. And then you can descend again, and then you keep that new altitude. And you step down in this fashion and finally approach the airport. This step-down approach is also known uh, by pilots as drive and dive. And it, it's, it, it's safe, it's certainly used worldwide, but it does make for a very heavy workload for the pilot because very often they're conducting these dives and then flattening out at the same time as the aircraft is turning. So that the aspect of the turning in the lateral is not shown here, but it does mean that there's an awful lot going on for the pilot uh, doing a step-down approach. In addition, when we step down and then fly flat, when we're flying flat, we do spool up the engines, and the noise can have an increased impact on the people who live below. And it's also true that when we're flying flat like that, we have spooled up the engines and we're using more fuel than we would if we could do an optimized profile descent. OPD is shown here, 
And what we mean by that is that we fly at altitude until we reach that point where the aircraft's normal descent rate, absent fuel, so I won't quite say idle thrust, but uh, 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 similar to the descent we would get with idle thrust, just allows the airplane to float down. Clearly that saves fuel. It prevents these spool ups that create the noise. And the pilot prefers it because this procedure, let's say when combined with a turn required to approach the airport, is simpler. It's easier to monitor that you're doing the right thing, and it's easier to be confident about it. Um, we do have some information about early flight trials for this in Louisville. Louisville was an early target for this because it is the hub city for UPS the big delivery company, and that means a tremendous number of UPS airports, uh, airplanes come in in the middle of the night, and the good folks of Louisville were particularly eager that they be as quiet as possible. Here's a, a more futuristic view of what we can do with area navigation, GPS, and the global navigation satellite systems. Notice that we have a runway here just heading in this direction here, and we're trying to land there. And we have the main arrival path coming here from this upper corner, three aircraft there. And there are three different aircraft, three different types of aircraft. So each one of them has a different ideal glide slope. Uh, the white one apparently likes to come in steeply, the light gray one kind of in between, and then the black one uh, is the, the flattest glide slope. What that means is we'll send them instructions allowing them to maneuver when they're still at altitude such that they arrive near the airport in the so-called terminal area with a spacing that allows them each to drift down in accord with their own finesse, their own uh, glide slope to the ground. The other thing that's shown here is uh, we allow for an aircraft that's just approaching from another direction. Normally, that aircraft would have to fly out here and get at the back of this line and come on in. But in a future air traffic management system, not today, we're talking about 10, 20 years, these aircraft will leave a space for this guy to join the approach pattern in a much more convenient and fuel efficient way for that aircraft. <clears throat> the trials of this kind of system have been conducted in San Francisco and the reason San Francisco is important is that most of the aircraft of course come from the body of the United States so they're coming from the east and um, they line up over the city of Livermore and form this kind of conga line that we show here. And the exception aircraft are those coming from Hawaii, let's say, or from the Pacific. And so it would be nice to allow them to enter the approach pattern at um, uh, a, a more convenient spot. One last example. <clears throat> this is uh, oceanic flight, and I think you can see here the country of New Zealand. They've been very, very active uh, in these trials, as has Australia. And what we consider here are flights from New Zealand to California. I think uh, this is supposed to be Los, Ange Los Angeles, LAX. And you can imagine three kinds of strategies. One is just fixed track, that we've built a certain number of alternatives from this flight for this uh, flight from New Zealand to California, and you can pick the best one available at the time uh, of day, but once you get on that uh, route, you have to stay on it, and uh, you don't get to accommodate or input any knowledge of current weather. If we go to user preferred routes, that refers to strategies or routes 
that you might choose just before you depart or on the, depart, on the day of your flight. So that's UPR. It's a little bit different than the fixed route because it's been optimized for winds. And it's been optimized for the winds that are present at the time you leave. If you want to take one more step in that direction, we have what we call dynamic rerouting, or DARP. And that means that not only can you adapt to the winds of the day, you can adapt to winds as they may change in your flight. And so we've left here with a user preferred route, but then there's a shift in the winds. Your computer tells you you would save fuel if you flew a little bit more to the north. So that's what you do. You get permission to do that. Communication is initiated with all the other aircraft that might be affected. And uh, if it's safe, they allow you to fly your now newly optimized route. When we talk about aviation, we all have to talk about safety. And we haven't really emphasized safety in these applications we've talked about here. We've emphasized saving time, efficiency, saving fuel, environmental concern. Um, but the third partner in the replanning of aviation or aviation routes has to be safety. Now, it would be nice if GPS and the other satellite navigation systems were perfect. That day in and day out, you got that five meter accuracy, that the, the scatter plot always reported points within the inner circle that you see there. Recall we've looked at this earlier, and here's the scatter plot. The radius of this is five meters, the radius of this is 10 meters, and out here we go to 15 meters. It would be nice if all day, every day, the reported position was inside that inner ring of the bullseye. But from time to time, something always happens in the operation of a system that's complicated. And so this, I believe, is data from April 2007, when a GPS satellite rose over the Pacific. When it rose over the Pacific, uh, it came in view of the Air Force Control Station in Colorado. And they used that opportunity to move the satellite. This is called station keeping. It happens once or twice a year. It's no big deal. It's very, very standard maintenance. However, usually when we station keep, uh, we do set the satellite unhealthy. We include in its navigation message a warning not to use this satellite now. Something's going on with it. In this very, very, very rare instance, we forgot. And if you included that satellite in your position fix, you'll discover that you fell well outside of the bullseye, and in fact, you had errors here of some 70 meters or so. Seventy meters is too large for uh, an aircraft approaching and landing at an airport. Seventy meters means that you're not on the runway. You're certainly not on the, in the center of the runway that you wanted to land at. You're well offset either to the left or the right. So two things are really, really important about that. First of all, these are extremely rare, at least in the case of GPS. The uh, ability of the Air Force to operate and maintain GPS is simply stunning. The probability of an event like this is 10 to the negative sixth or so per satellite hour. And so um, GPS is certainly a system that can be used for aviation. If these kind of blunders happened 100 times more frequently, it may not be that we could kind of recover the aviation application for GPS. Um, if it was 100 times more reliable, we wouldn't have to augment GPS in any way. But 
given that this failure rate is greater than what we can accept for the safety of aviation, we do go ahead and augment GPS. And here's one of the ways we do that. This is the so-called ground-based augmentation system. And uh, it is airport specific. So here's the runway we're trying to land at right there. Here's the approaching aircraft. It's receiving GPS satellite signals from the antenna on top of the fuselage. At the same time, we're receiving those same GPS signals over at the airport. And this looks like a differential GPS architecture, and in fact it is. This data is backhauled from these antennas, sent into this processor, which creates corrections, reference measurements, just like we spoke about, that are broadcast up to the approaching aircraft. However, this particular architecture serves a different, uh, an additional function. Not only does it improve the accuracy of GPS for the approaching aircraft, the ground system also detects and isolates any satellites that are suffering from a fault. And then those are excluded from the set that the aircraft is allowed to use. So we say that this ground-based augmentation system not only improves accuracy, it improves the integrity of the position fix. So uh, the 10 meter errors are reduced to one meter, nominally, day in and day out, and those 60 meter outliers are excluded altogether. This architecture is so important, this idea is so important, but we also have a continental version of it, and that's called a satellite-based augmentation system. It's shown here. So we have some 38 reference receivers sprinkled across North America, and uh, they are all making reference measurements. And rather than reporting them just to the nearby processor, those measurements are being backhauled to a small set of master control stations. There's one on the East Coast, there's one on the West Coast, and they're also hot backup for both of those. Those guys are creating special differential corrections. I won't go into the detail, but you can certainly look it up. Special differential corrections that are not only valid in the neighborhood of the reference receivers, but valid across the whole continent. The reason we do this is there are some 10,000 airports or so in North America, and it would be too costly to put a ground-based augmentation system at each one of them. So we use this continental service, and we provide a uh, accuracy and integrity service to aircraft approaching all of the smaller airports on the continent. We use that earlier strategy, the ground-based augmentation system, uh, for larger airports. Well, that's all for today. I hope you've enjoyed this excursion into the aviation use of differential GPS.